How are you doing? I just want to take a little bit of time to um, specifically talk a little bit about um, the dynamics of culture and socialization, how those things are going to be related to what it is that we do here within the world of sport. Um, keeping in mind that, kind of as a quick review, while we're primarily using the sociology sport framework, um, you know, we will be integrating ideas from psychology, education, history, uh, business, human resource management, all those different types of things. But but sociology, and primarily the sociology of sport, is the, the um, overarching framework for discussing how and why we are able to look at and understand the dynamics that are so prevalent within the world of sport. And the reason we like to do that is sociology is a, um, a framework that focuses on groups of people. Now, a group can be hundreds of thousands, millions, or billions on the global scale, if you will, or a group can be two people, a dyadic group or a triadic group with three people. And so this, what sociology does is it allows us a lot of flexibility um, when focusing on, uh, you know, the, this framework that is sport. Now, primarily sociology sport is going to look at organizing competitive sports, uh, but what we're going to try to do is bring in this whole idea of intramurals, leisure and recreation activities, other extracurricular activities involving health and wellness, uh, because a lot of the patterns are going to be very, very, very similar. When we're talking about health, for example, we're talking about not just, according to the World Health Organization, we're talking about not just the absence of disease or infirmity, we're talking about a holistic understanding of the individual, emotional health, mental health, and physical health. And since there's been um, you know, documented research for decades, decades, and decades looking at um, the relationship between um, self-esteem, self-efficacy, confidence, um, lack of depression, things like that, combined with the physical benefits, you can start to see why health, physical activity, sports, recreation, all that stuff kind of works together. When you look at trying to understand what we mean by people, um, sociology it comes out of a social scientific tradition. Um, so utilizing the social, uh, not just the sociological method, but using the scientific method as well, looking at using deductive reasoning, uh, primarily um, research-based methodologies that allow us to really understand not just who we are as people, but how is it that these interactions are available and influence what it is that we do every day within the world of sport. And the thing, the kind of the basic underlying assumption here is that um, sociology looks at groups of people, looks at organizations, and it looks at the resulting interactions. We as individuals are all part of groups, um, and, and sports are, are no exception to this rule because even the individual sports, golf, tennis to some extent, some things like that, there still is some sort of social structure present. Well, what do I mean by social structure? Well, there's people that are watching, there's sponsors, um, if you have large events, uh, but even if the idea of golf and the whole sort of Legend of Bagger Vance scenario where you're out on the golf course by yourself, um, do you call a penalty stroke on yourself? And a lot of people would because that's the influence of society. That's the influence of rules and norms on the individual. Even when literally no one else is around, many people quote unquote do the right thing. And so that that's again a byproduct or an example of how these social interactions are resultant from something larger than just individuals. There's this idea of a society or a culture that influence us. Well, a society is a little bit more geography based. It's talking about those people that live in a clearly defined area with parameters. And so we can talk about American society or the contiguous United States. We're talking about the lower 48. Um, whereas culture is something a little bit more amorphous. It's a little bit more um, subtle. And so we talk about, okay, American culture. Well, what is American culture? It's 350 million plus people. It's very large in terms of the actual physicality of the United States. And if you look at the definition of culture, learn patterns of thinking, behaving, and acting. And what's really important here is this whole idea of the word learned. And you know, when we're born, we don't necessarily know exactly how to behave or how to act in a particular group or society. And so where do we learn that? And that's what becomes very important for us within the world of sport because sport can be one of those places where you learn these things. These are just some important ideas that are drawn from sociology in general that have been 
uh, focused on or examined within the sociology of sport. And these are going to be some dynamics or tools that we're going to apply to better understand this institution of sport, recreation, and physical activity. As we talked about before, okay, you have culture, which is essentially this, this social heritage of people, all right? And, and you, it's hard to see culture, but what you do is you see manifestations of culture, such as uh, customs, uh, a knowledge base or different languages, different foods, uh, different ways of dressing, that kind of thing. And if you start to think about sport, and, and focus on this word language and knowledge, all right? Sports, to be very, very productive and efficient in sports, you have to learn a, a new language. You have to learn a different reservoir of knowledge. Now, it's not to say you, you don't, you're going to have different values or customs, but you're going to have values or customs that relate directly to whatever sport it is that you're talking about. And so culture is this large monolithic idea that we would like to parcel out and learn a little bit more about. And so we start looking at the components of culture. And uh, some very, very simple, when I used to teach intro to sociology, these are ideas that we would talk about, but they're very, very powerful. Um, norms and values are two aspects of culture. Norms are just ways of behaving, and they're prescribed by usually a particular culture. Now, these are unwritten rules most of the time. Now, there's three types of norms. You have the folkways, the mores, and the laws. The laws are exactly what they sound like. Um, norms that are so important, we've encoded them into laws or rules of a particular organization or culture and society. Mores um, kind of relate to the word morality, and so these are things that kind of get at that gut-wrenching soul of the individual, you know, like when we talk about the incest taboo, well that would be a moray. Oftentimes murder is a moray. Now you don't, you have some mores obviously, and the violation of mores in sport, you know, if you're thinking about the um, Sandusky case at Penn State, you know, one of the things that's so reprehensible about that is that it involved young children. And regardless of gender, whether they're boys or girls, the fact that you have someone who is acting as a predator and pursuing young children, taking advantage of them. And this happened all within the, the, the confines of sport. And so you can kind of see how um, that sort of visceral reaction for anyone that read any of those depositions or that testimony or anything like that, um, maybe that sort of that, that sick feeling in the pit of your stomach, that's a physiological reaction to the social mores that are so prevalent here in American culture. Now, folkways, that's the normal, ordinary stuff every single day. So, like in certain sports, you have things you can and cannot do. You know, think about all the unwritten rules in baseball, for example, or if you're talking about, you know, the things that are very, very commonplace that athletes, coaches, parents, consumers, you all kind of pick up on certain ways of cheering and not cheering and the fact you're not supposed to cheer when uh, an opposing player gets hurt, that kind of thing. Okay, these are going to be folk ways. Now, we often talk about norms and values, and we tend to kind of put those two things together, which is very understandable. They're similar, but they are analytically different. Values are ideas, okay, collective ideas to what are desirable, correct, and good. They are dare I say, valuable, something we're striving for, okay? And so a value is an idea, whereas a norm has a bit more of a behavioral component to it, things you should do or should not do, prescriptions and proscriptions, okay? Values are going to be ideas that we strive for. And so think about American culture and what are some values that we well, value here in American culture? Competition, work ethic, um, success, winning, those types of things, and that's not bad, okay? The, it's just tough sometimes to be self-reflexive and look at these um, these values and, and how those things actually influence the sport. And you'll hear this phrase a lot, sport is a microcosm of a society, with the idea that you can look at sports of a particular culture and kind of in a petri dish, you know, and you're able to learn a lot about the people of that grouping by just looking at the games that they play because the values are highlighted, the norms are going to be highlighted. Okay? And if you think about does sport, and this is sort of a rhetorical question, but does sport in general um, promote values that contradict those in larger American culture? And that's something that, that we have to kind of examine and that's why we keep talking about uh, looking at this institution of sport and trying to make it better. 
you know, one of the things that sport managers do is they examine this institution and they're constantly trying trying to change it for the better. Well, what constitutes the better? That that really depends on your analysis of that type of question. Does sport promote any values that contradict those values in, in larger American culture? One way of really analyzing and understanding sport is through the notion of symbols. Okay, down here. Now symbols the definition of symbol is probably one of the greatest academic definitions I've ever come across. <laughs> it's amazing. A symbol is something that stands for something else. That's it. And what I like about that is, in its simplicity, is pure genius. All right, something that stands for something else. All right, and when you think about this whole notion of sport in American culture and the fact that athletes are going to be role models, well, why are they role models? Because they're on TV a lot? Um, just because you can sink a 15-foot jump shot, what does that necessarily make you a good moral person and worthy of serving as a role model for children? Well, it doesn't. But we've sort of amalgamated this idea of sport and character. All right, So sport builds character. So those people that are in sport longer, such as elite amateur athletes with the Olympics or if you're talking about professional athletes then as the theory goes these people should be very moral and worthy of role modeling for our children okay? and what we're going to find is that symbols are very important in culture in general they, they teach us about it you know dress language these things are all just symbols and if you look at the the importance of uniforms or logos, mascots, imagery within sport, you really start to see, okay, if you are the Dallas Cowboys, that star is very important to you. Right? And you don't want people you know, disrespecting or denigrating that star. Well, that star is only important to people that follow the Dallas Cowboys, that consider themselves avid fans or supporters, that kind of thing. So symbols also serve as a focal point for identifying groups of people within the world of sport that consider themselves uh, together or one. All right, when you talk about Manchester United or, or some of the um, uh, you know, elite premier soccer teams in Europe and, and the fans walking in with the banners and sort of all that pomp and circumstance that goes along with it, well, that, that's a good example of symbolism and the power of symbolism that it has on people. And, and these are just all aspects uh, that come out of kind of anthropology or micro-level sociology when looking at and understanding culture. Ideologies are um, kind of, I mean, in a simplistic sense, they're just simply ways of thinking about the world. Um, social life is very complicated, it's very convoluted. Anytime you're dealing with people, it's it's very complex. And so we tend to fall back on these preconceived ideas. Now we're not talking stereotypes, okay? Um, when we talk about ideologies, ways that people, individually and collectively, construct and make sense of the social world around them that can be so hectic. And so uh, an ideology is, okay, how do I think about the world of sport with regard to religion? Tim Tebow sort of brought this, really highlighted this whole idea of amalgamating religious ideologies and how we normally construct sport. And so when he Tebow's on the sideline and, and integrates prayer and, and talks about you know, his religious faith, some people really enjoy that, some people really do not. And part of that, for those people that do not, oftentimes it's this sort of separation of, of church and the public. You f they, they feel like, well, okay, he's forcing his religious ideology onto me. And that makes him a very polarizing figure and has for many, many, many years, going back to his college and even, if I recall, back to his high school days. Um, but there are a variety of different ideologies, political ideologies, religious ideologies. Um, some of the main ideological structures that we'll talk about in sport are gender, race, and class. Now, race and ethnicity are technically separate. We'll talk about them together. Okay, uh, Race is more the, the physiological... Uh, differences based upon genetics and things like that, kind of biological differences. Ethnicity is pure social construction, and so it's the way that we have separated ourselves uh, based upon certain characteristics or social heritage. Well, all these different things, if you kind of harken back to the um, uh, the old days when, when people used to, if you're kind of making fun of a boy and trying to motivate him, say, don't throw like a girl. 
All right, well, that, that old archaic notion is a good example of a gender ideology that's so prevalent in sport. You know, there's a lot of people that define athleticism in the world of sport as um, essentially what males do. Uh, they jump out of the gym if you're talking about basketball, and this, uh, there's a high premium paced upon, placed upon athleticism and individuality, whereas many of the uh, women's sports tend to focus more on teamwork and moving of the collective versus the individual. Well, that's the way men's sports used to be, but it, it has evolved over the last three or four decades. And so you can only anticipate that women's sports will continue to evolve in the same way. But currently, right now, you know, we have this stark contrast between how we view women's sports and men's sports. And that those people that are very against or very for um, are usually, when they talk about that, they're representing some sort of ideology. Social structure. Oof. Social structure is one of those things that's really kind of interesting. Um... And the reason it's interesting is because there's the definition for you, all right? And that's this, Dr. Turner is, you know, someone far more intelligent than I am. But when you start looking at all of these definitions and people trying to define social structure, it gets very complicated. So the way I think about it is social structure does exactly that. It gives us organization. It provides order. That's it. Now, it's not order that you can see, touch, taste, or smell, necessarily. But when you walk into a situation, when you walk into your sport organization the very first day to work there, you already have a rough idea of what to expect. How is it that you know what to expect? You're going to put on your golf shirt and uh, tuck it into, you know, whatever sort of pants or skirt or whatever it is that you're wearing. And you're going to look nice and you're going to do your hair and you're going to be this quote-unquote professional. Well, that is an example of social structure. You had an expectation of how business is done within sport organizations here in the United States. All right? And so while you know social structure is there, it, it influences you, you don't necessarily see it. You see manifestations of it, but you don't necessarily see it. Some great examples, roles, status, um, the groups that we belong to. The identity of the individual is kind of interesting because... It's multifaceted. It's kind of like a diamond. Um, and the idea is that the more roles that you're involved with, like right now your students, uh, perhaps your employees, your siblings in your family, uh, maybe some of you are parents, uh, many of you are your sons or your daughters, these are different roles. And these, these roles, when combined together, give you a role set. And with these roles, essentially provide you a, a script of how to act. Now you're not being false or you're not playing a part or anything like that, but I, I, the way I think about it is I speak differently and I interact differently with my parents than I do um, at school. And I interact and speak differently at school than I do around my friends and so on and so forth. And so each part, each role that I take throughout the day is associated with different expectations and norms and what I'm supposed to do and that type of thing. Well, and this kind of becomes interesting because when you talk about athletes, for example, you know, recently uh, Adrian Peterson was uh, arrested down in Houston. He's running back for the Minnesota Vikings, and he was arrested down in Houston for uh, basically unruly behavior at a nightclub and pushing a police officer and that kind of thing. And um, It's kind of interesting because the role that we see Adrian Peterson, we see professional football players on TV. We see them performing. And then we kind of have expectations of how they're supposed to act off the field. And people are always surprised that then you have individuals, professional athletes, for example, that get in trouble. Now, there are many professional athletes that do not get in trouble, much like individuals in the general public of that similar age group. Many get in trouble and many do not get in trouble. But all these different, the status that's afforded to professional athletes, for example, is a byproduct of the role that they play, which is oftentimes high profile and involved in entertainment covered by the media. Okay, all of these things help to influence how we think and how we act within the world of sport. And that's all I'm trying to get across with social structures, that it doesn't have to be as complicated. It, it's kind of, a lot of this sociological stuff is very common sense. I'm trying to put definitions to the understandings that you all already have. And the reason I'm trying to put definitions to it is so that 
we all have a common vocabulary, and then we can start to link up, synthesize these individual ideas that you all have probably already stumbled upon yourself. And once we're able to synthesize them, then we can better understand sport, sport organizations, and all that type of thing. Social dynamics and facts. Um, again, this is just, um, it's very, these are very, very important ideas to sociology because what they're talking about, Auguste Comte was kind of the person that coined the word sociology, the study of society and that kind of thing, the study of the social. And basically what he did was he divided the world up into two basic categories, things that are static and things that are dynamic. And he's not being overtly uh, creative here. Social statics are things that are static, things that don't, ter that don't move terribly quickly, they don't evolve, they don't change much. Oftentimes this could be something like ideas. Um, the, most people prior to 40 years ago when we had you know, the beginning of Title IX, the role of women within sport was very, very static. Girls played games. As you grew up into a woman, you tended to stay away from games uh, unless it involved your children and your form of recreation was usually involving kids. Well, with the advent of Title IX, especially in American culture, that started to change. And that leads us into the second term or second typology, which is dynamic. Um, ideas within the world of sport or actions within the world of sport that are constantly changing. You know what's actually what's dynamic in sport, and this is not necessarily good, but uh, cheating. Cheating. You know, think about you know, blood doping, gene manipulation, and you know, things like cycling and so forth. Um, just the whole exercise science field and how to maximize performance of the physiological entity that is the athlete, that is a very, very dynamic field. It is constantly changing. Okay, and that kind of gives a sense for what Comte was talking about. Well, another one of Comte's contemporaries was Emile Durkheim, and this, this whole idea of the social fact is actually really important for sociology, and it gives us a sense for how and why we uh, tend to kind of quote-unquote judge people within the world of sports so much. And just kind of take a second and just look and read that definition to yourself. It's essentially something that's outside of our biology. It's outside of us and it's outside of our thought processes. So it's outside of our physiology and it's outside of our psychology. But even though it's outside of us, the totality of us, it does constrain or influence how we behave. Whoa. So now we're talking about things outside of us and this could be something as simple as expectations. You know, the expectation, or think about scholastic athletes. Now it's a rule, but it's still an expectation as well. You have to have a minimum GPA or else you're not going to be able to participate in athletics. And I guess that's at the college level as well. I shouldn't restrict it to scholastic athletics. All right. But that's something that's external to the biological mental processes of the individual, that GPA, that mandated GPA. If we're talking about the APR rates and things like that uh, within the NCAA, then those things are going to constrain, influence the behavior of the individual. Hey, I need to make sure that our APR is going to be 930 as compared to 900. It's moving up to 930 now, which basically means that every athlete on a team needs to have uh, roughly a 2.5 GPA. Okay, and for some that's not going to be hard at all. For others, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. All right, and so you have this mandated GPA out there that is going to influence the fact that, you know, maybe it's Friday night. Instead of going out, you need to go to the library and hit the books a little bit for a couple of days. Um, I know a lot of, you know, in college towns they'll have midweek uh, drink and dan dance specials and things like that. So on a Tuesday night, you know, maybe it's very popular for a lot of people to go out. Um, but instead of going out with friends, you go to the library for a couple of hours because you know that on Thursday, perhaps, you have an exam and you need to make sure that you do well on that exam so that you do well in the class, so that you maintain your 2.5, so that you help to maintain that 930 APR for your particular athletic team. Because as we know with the NCAA, uh, University of Connecticut recently, um, if that APR is not satisfactory, then your athletic squad or team is banned from postseason competition. And what can that do to a program? Well, it can send people to start transferring, or if it's something like the NBA, um, send people to or NBA, 
listen to me, <laughs> if you're, you're talking about men's basketball, um, maybe it sends guys that are kind of on the fence. They say, you know, I'm going to go ahead and declare for the draft. And think about the ramification that has. Maybe they're not ready, so then they don't get drafted. They end up in the MBDL, the developmental league, or they play in Europe or in the Caribbean or South America, and it, it kind of greatly alters their career for the next couple of years. That's all I'm talking about. It's just something that's outside, exogenous, outside of us, but it still has uh, quite a bit of influence over what it is that we do. Again, going back to that example of professionalism, you know, you're going to dress up, you're going to be on time, you're going to take a shower, you're going to do all those different things. And for some of you, and I've seen you, it's, it's okay, you know, you like to schlub around and that's all right. But when you go to work, you're a professional, you're on time. This this whole uh, calling in because you have, you know, the brown bottle flu or whatever, that's not professional and, and people know that. And so you're going to stay away from that behavior as you start to move into your sport organizations. The sociological imagination. Um, arguably, this is one of my, I don't want to say favorite, but I think it's one of the more unique ideas out there. Um, it's kind of coined and put together by C. Wright Mills in the early to mid-1950s with the idea that your own personal views are actually influenced by larger structural things. And, and this is such an important idea that Levitt in 1983 coined the marketing imagination in more business and marketing ideas with the idea that, you know what, we just simply need to look and understand this, this dichotomy that is micro and macro because they operate simultaneously. Um, if you think about the, the salad idea versus the stew idea, and I use for food as a metaphor oftentimes, but um, okay, in a salad you can pull out everything, separate it, and see it, right? Well, in a stew, things kind of break down to the point that it starts to kind of coalesce into one kind of gelatinous, wonderful goo, right? Well, and that's more a little bit what social life is. It's hard to really differentiate, pick out, parcel out different ideas. And the sociological imagination is important for helping us explain why sport or why social life is more stew-like as compared to more salad-like. And I promise no more food references for the rest of the lecture. So the sociological imagination is based on personal biography, history, time, and recognizing how and why that which is our personal life fits into a larger process. What does that mean? Well, it means that my, and I've told this story many times in many classes all the time, but it's, it's an oldie but a goodie, one of my favorite sports is lacrosse. And lacrosse is primarily a sport, especially while I was growing up, primarily a sport in the northeastern part of the United States. And I did not grow up in the northeastern part of the United States. I grew up in Texas and New Mexico. So how is it that someone like me, who's you know living in these little dust bowl, tiny dirt towns, loves lacrosse? Well, it's simply because of the economics of some of the small towns in which I was living. All right, and so now this is going to be the micro. My love of lacrosse is actually influenced by economics, tax-based infrastructure things. Basically, one of the small towns I was living in, um, ConAgra purchased um, the co-op that was there, and in working with uh, co-op in the agriculture area and, and things like that. What they did is they hired some new people. One of the individuals that they hired had some um, uh, a, a degree in ag economics and, and that kind of thing and it was very very important for what it is that they wanted to do in this particular town. Well this person that they hired was from upstate New York um, and so they brought them down. Well these people eventually settled in next to us. I had two brothers so there's three Vermilion boys there was four of them, and so these boys played together a lot. The kids from upstate New York were playing this game called lacrosse. Didn't really know much about it. I, I'd heard a little bit about it, knew a little bit here and there. Didn't have a stick or anything. Well, they, they gave us some sticks. They showed us how to play the game. Played that for years and years and years, and that sort of set the, set the path for me in terms of how and why I consume lacrosse the way that I do. Okay.
personally, the micro of the situation is, you know what? I dig the game lacrosse, man. I just really do. The macro is that was not going to be possible unless the economics and the business climate of that particular town was the way that it was. Because if it wasn't, if you didn't have this merger and someone coming in and taking over and purchasing and all that kind of stuff, this person would not have been hired and brought down from New York down to where we were living. That's just simply the way it is. Now, if you expand that story into a million or billion of stories that you all have as individuals or that everyone has in the world, you can start to see that sport operates. It's very emotional, so it operates on the individual level. When I'm watching the Packers, I get, I get upset, man. You know, it's very emotional. I get very happy. But sport also operates on the macro level. And you have roughly a third, a little over a third of the U.S. population self-reports participating in some sort of organized or recreational sport. That's a lot of people, man. All right, so we're talking about, you know, over 100 million people, and we're talking about one person all within the world of sport. And so this idea, the sociological imagination, helps to bridge that for us. Okay. So how do we learn everything? Well, that's where the idea of socialization comes in. Socialization just talks a little bit about how we learn. We've already identified that, okay, we, we have to be a part of a culture because you're born into a society and all that kind of stuff, but we don't know what that culture is. We have to learn it. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, I mean, commonsensically, you learn about things by just simply interacting with people. Okay, and, and that's good stuff there. You know, if you think about how the, the people that are in your lives, your, your family, which can include parents or guardians, um, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, siblings, cousins, you name it. All right, those people, for many people, are important. All right, then you have peers, friends. Other people find teachers or coaches very important. Uh, civic or religious leaders. All right, there's a lot of people in your life that are important that have helped you formulate your worldview. Now, what is your worldview? So, well, that's how you see the world. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's not this grand idea. It's just simply that you operate in a social world. When we walk into certain situations, we have expectations. We have ideas. We, as individuals, are limited by our experience. And what does that mean? Well, essentially just the idea that as you experience more of the world, as you experience more sport, for example, you have more experiences to draw from. And you're, the way you see things, the way you see people, the way you see politics, the way you see sport, all this stuff changes and evolves. It's what, remember what Kampf was talking about, a, a social dynamic. These things are malleable, malleable and they're constantly changing. All right. Socialization oftentimes rears the question of what's more important, the instincts of the individual or the social environment. And for our purposes in here, sociology falls down here. All right. But we cannot deny the instinctual emotional element of sport. So we do know that nature is important. For our purposes, I, I don't really care what the answer is. The answer is none of it. The answer is all of it. It's both of these, none of these, however you want to look at it. What's important for us is that we realize that how we interact with people is governed by a lot of different things. But when I say governed, we, we as individuals are not little tiny robots. We are autonomous beings. All right? So we can go out there and we make our own choices. Well, our choices are influenced by our experiences, our instincts, and the places that we've grown up and the values that we've drawn from those different communities. So socialization is all of this stuff crammed into one tiny little word. Well, the sociological imagination was talking about bridging the micro and the macro. All right? And to understand how we learn culture, culture is a very, very macro level thing. So to understand how we learn culture, we talk about the socialization process which is essentially kind of an, an arrow between the individual and society. Well, now we need to talk about the individual. 
Well, you coined sort of the self, right? The development of the self is very important. And if you think back to structural functionalism, um, one of the big things for functionalist view of sport was that sport is positive. You learn character. You, you build hard, hard working work ethic traits and uh, these things, these attributes that you pick up from sport. These are life lessons that you learn and these become part of your value system, that kind of thing. All right. Well, so we have sport as this milieu where you can learn these different things. But we're st we still, up to this point, haven't talked about how you as an individual develop. And I'm not talking about from a psychological or human development point of view, because you've had all that stuff before. But we're talking about how that multifaceted identity of the individual, the self, how that thing develops. And that is really kind of the rudder, if you will, of this boat that is an individual human. And then we cruise up and down the river that essentially is culture and society. And so all these things are interacting. Okay? Charles Horton Cooley is talking about the living glass self, and he simply said that, and this is an old idea going back to the late 1920s, he said, we just simply want to look and see how other people see us. So kind of imagine sort of floating up out of your body and, and watching yourself. Or, you know, when you walk by a mirror, most of the time we, we you know, most people kind of check themselves out to see what they look like and that kind of thing. And the idea there is that we just simply want to, uh, the most important key idea is that we want to understand ourself, who we are, even something as simple as the way we look, from another's point of view. All right, And that sort of sets the stage for understanding what Goffman would later expand upon in the 1960s. He talks about dramaturgical analysis, which, don't, don't get bogged down in all this, this just means drama, right? So instead of using social science as much, he kind of drew from Shakespeare and said, you know, Life is a stage, so to speak. And the idea is that whatever situation you go into, because you have an understanding of yourself as from kind of a divorced step back point of view, we are able to then manage our impression within that situation. Well, that's kind of interesting. And very commonsensical. When you go on an interview for an internship or a job, you're going to speak act and dress differently than you do every day because you know this is different this is important and so I need to portray not a false sense of yourself not not someone different but a much more professional part of you and so impression management is not necessarily about being fake but about emphasizing or de-emphasizing certain self characteristics in specific situations you know some teachers are much more formal in the classroom others are much more informal that's not good or bad. That's just the kind of their their teaching style is a reflection of how they were managing their impression in that particular class. Then you had a guy named George Herbert Mead. And and Mead was kind of interesting because he was actually a psychologist. Now he was a social psychologist, but back in in twenties and thirties and things like that, they didn't really differentiate social psychology much. And so you can kind of see some overlap. Um, there's a similar structure to how he views the self as how Freud viewed sort of the individual personality. You had the id, the ego, and the superego, that kind of thing. Well, that same idea when you talk about the, the development of the self, Mead saw you had the kind of impulsive part of you that you just want to do stuff, you want to have a good time, you just want to cut loose, a la tailgating, all right? You know, it, it's a situation where you can just let it go, man. You're going to paint it up and stand in 25 degree weather and have a good time. Well, that's the impulsive part. The me, so you have the I, the me, the mind. The me is more that conservative, conventional part. It represents that society says, no, this is what you should or should not be doing. This is the norms and the values. All right, the mind of the self essentially kind of mediates between the two. And it says that in certain situations, you know, if I'm tailgating, I can act this way. If I'm going into a job interview for the San Antonio Spurs, then I'm going to act this way. Okay, and so it's this balancing act back and forth. I, I just like I just like looking at this because, you know what? It's complicated, man, and there's just so much stuff. When you talk about people, people are amazing because they're weird, and I mean that in the the most complimentary sense. There's no black and white. 
it's all gray. You know, we, as we talked about with ideographic and nomothetic earlier in the year, is that every time you think you can predict everything, you're going to find someone or something that goes against that trend. And, and, and the self is kind of like that. I mean, you're looking at communication, empathy, emotion, literally where the bodies are, the relationship with community, what you assume yourself is like, the actual self interacting with others through symbolic interpretation of things. Whoa. It's just very complicated. Now, we're trying to use some ideas here that are fairly simplistic to understand something that's very complicated. Sport and socialization in particular, and I guess this is probably the most important point, which, which is why it's highlighted, is that sport and socialization, socialization, that relationship, it's a process. It doesn't happen just one time. It happens with multiple encounters. And you start participating in sport or you start consuming sport early on. And, and for many people, not all, but for many people, this is a lifelong process. And so this process is going to continue and continue and continue. And each time it does, it influences that individual just a little bit more. Traditionally in the United States, here in American culture, because of the way that sport has come about in uh, kind of modern Western society, American culture associates sport as a positive thing. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an extension of the classroom. And the mass media is going to kind of pick up on that because this is, you know, we're talking about here in American culture, the media is going to kind of buy in to some of the same norms and values as well, some of the same ideological structures because the individuals that run the mass media are individuals in American culture as well. And so we have this then process where sport is this positive thing where people can learn. Now there's some bad things that happen in sport, we know that. But overall, you, you, know, you hear about the, the youth sport coach, like the, the hockey coach recently in, in Canada that it was, I think it was 13 year olds and they're going through the handshake line and he just kicks and trips one of the opposing players. So you have this 40 year old man, <laughs> a little Gundy action there, I'm a man, I'm 40. And then all of a sudden he, he, he trips his 13 year old kid because he didn't like what happened. Okay, that's more or less from a functionalist point of view, that's an outlier. Most people aren't like that, okay? And so this positivity that's promoted, well, that's picked up by the media, and that's generally what people think of youth sports or scholastic sports as being associated with. Now, at some point, there's this thing called the internalization model, which is you hear and you see the values associated with sport because you participated. And at some point, and the internalization model does not tell us at which that point occurs, but at some point you start believing that this is the right thing and that sport does reflect these positive values in society or culture. Okay, good example here. Remember after like after a youth sport softball or baseball game, you do the handshake line, right? Well, why are you doing that? It's to show sportsmanship, good sporting behavior. But a lot of the children that are involved don't really understand the abstract concept of good sporting behavior. They're doing it because, well, they're supposed to, and they want to get their pop over in the ice chest afterwards, and that's what the coach says, is you have to do this, so okay. Well, at some point, as that, that youth sport athlete is growing up, they start to think that it's important, and they agree with the act of good sporting behavior and shaking hands with their opponents afterwards. Okay, I don't know when it happens, junior high, high school, college, never for some people. The internalization model is something that tries to basically explain this social psychological process. But it doesn't give ex you know, explicit dates, times, hours, or things like that. It's not like all of a sudden, oh, you turn 17 and a half, then you're going to really understand this. It's different for each person based upon their experience within the world of sport. These are just some of the positive effects or impacts that have been identified within sport and theoretically that structural functionalism promotes. And you can kind of see that, okay, if you're talking about relationships and experience, and, and the irony here is that you're using sports to develop your identity outside of sports. 
But for so many people, they spend so much time having their children involved in sports or an athlete becomes so involved in sports that that becomes their entire identity. Right? And so even though functionalism is stressing these positive things, you can start to see how, you know what, sometimes it doesn't always work out exactly how you think. You know, clear and consistent messages regarding values. Well, as we know, okay, coaches are going to be the first line of defense regarding the dissemination of these clear and consistent messages regarding values, except we don't explicitly teach coaches how to coach, do we? So this isn't perfect, but these are the theoretical ideas that are associated. Different, different theories have different views. Um, obviously, conflict theory is a little bit more cynical, a little bit more depressed. And since they have that economic focus, they believe that economics of sport actually determine who plays and who is going to benefit from sports. The notion that you know traveling baseball in junior high and high school is an expensive thing. Club volleyball, listening to the fact that some of these parents will spend fifteen thousand dollars on their daughters for club volleyball. Okay, not every family can afford to do that, so therefore not every family and every participant is going to benefit from sports exactly. Symbolic interactionism and those critical theories are talking about, you know, identity and connecting meaning with sport. And oftentimes, if you've heard, uh, there's a lot of research done last few years by the NCAA looking at sport experiences of student athletes within the NCAA framework. And kind of one of the overriding ideas is that student athletes overall have a positive view of their experience as a student athlete because it provided them with experiences that they never would have been able to get anywhere else. Very unique. All right, so that's kind of a positive way. But that, that is understanding, attempting to understand where that individual came from, the school that they played, the sport that they played, and how they now are able to take those sport experiences and have them influence the rest of their adult life. Feminism is concerned with obviously looking at gendered relations and dynamics, hegemonic masculinity, things like that. Um, and, and it talks a little bit, quite a bit about the marginalization of women within sports is one of those things that's constantly happening. So what it's forced, <coughs> excuse me, is female sports to adopt what um, Mike Mister talks about as or calls the masculine center, which is, okay, this is how sport is modeled out now. Men play the sport a certain way. And for example, let's talk about basketball. It's about athleticism, dunking, one-on-one -on -one isolation, uh, some pick and rolls, that kind of thing, getting up and down the court, fast break opportunities. Just athleticism is equally pervasive in every aspect of the game. So dunking has become this thing that's very common but very marketable within men's basketball. As a result, female basketball players in general feel this pressure to live up to um, the the standard quote unquote that's being set by men and this includes dunking and they asked uh, um, Pat some before she retired about you know one of her players uh, dunking in the middle of the game and she's like no she's like it's we're not quite there yet and honestly two points is two points and it's not a for sure given thing I want the two points, I don't want the showboating. But this adopting the masculine center, they also talk about, if you remember a couple years ago in the WNBA, there was that pretty gnarly brawl, Candace Parker and some others, after a free throw attempt and all that kind of stuff. And it got pretty, got pretty funky there for a while, you know. And um, people have talked about that example as, and you can kind of look and see if you want to look at the YouTube video and you can see how the, the young women are aggressively positioning themselves and, and a lot of people have noted that they've done so in a very, very masculine way. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, and to say that, you know, from a feminist point of view, adopting the masculine center would probably be fairly bad because you're giving up the purity of the game and feeling pressure to evolve how you as a gender, how you as a sport are doing something to kind of give in and bow to this public pressure of, of consumerism. Yeah, there's pros and cons for each approach, but that's, you know, what feminism might look at. Ah, which one's right? 
Well, and this kind of goes back to what we talked about with nature versus nurture. Neither. Neither one is right. Both are right. All of them are right. I don't know. It's so complicated. But what I do know is, remember when I talked about using the buffet method? Like what we're going to do is, if you want to talk about the socializing impact, and so let's say you're in recreation, and you want to try to explain to uh, some youth sport parents how and why your summer league sport, whatever it is, is important. You're engaging in a theoretical discussion regarding socialization. Now, whether you explicitly articulate that or not, that's what you're doing. And probably what you're going to do is you're going to use bits and pieces from each of those theoretical viewpoints to help explain and expand on this notion of socialization, how sport is part of that process. And that's what it is that we want to do, is keep synthesizing. One theory is not the best. Now, there may be one theory is better for each particular argument or each particular scenario or situation you're talking about, but to say that functionalism is the best way to view sport is just flat out wrong. And to say conflict theory is the best way to view sport is just flat out inaccurate. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to understand these theories, take little bits and pieces from them, and use those bits and pieces to explain whatever dynamic in this particular case, socialization. If you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. I appreciate it. And um, good luck with the module.